The F and Red Snowboard Podcast is sponsored by Wired Snowboards. I rode my Chase 162 at Great Northern Snowcats this week. You should check out greatnorthernsnowcat.com for more information on this epic operation. Thanks, Al Clark. The Chase was the perfect tool for enjoying steep technical trees and burnt tree forests, two of my absolute favorite things to ride in the world. You can get a Wired Snowboard at the Boardroom Snowboard Shop. Go to boardroomshop.com for all your snowboarding needs. Support for the show also comes from Grouse Mountain, Dekine Outerwear and Accessories, Vans Boots, and Tribute Board Shop in Nelson, B.C. Stay tuned after the show, and I'll come up with some way to give away one of those Dekine backpacks I've been talking about all year. It was a totally fun time, didn't get too gnarly. I kind of look at the Mystery Air as an improved evolution of the Switchblade. Snowboarding is ours. And you know, obviously I like working with Burton. As an old school snowboarder, you get so used to being treated as a second class citizen. And I was like, how do you spell your last name? He's like, K-E-L-L-Y. And I was like, oh, we should get married. And he's like, no, too symmetrical. I'm starting this week's show with a correction. Eric Thompson on Instagram reached out and let me know that BC Hydro is still owned by the people of BC. I got pretty loose in the Willie interview and was kind of talking out my ass there, but you can actually learn the full story at thetaiyi.ca or Google BC Hydro from public interest to private profits to learn the actual story, which does involve US-owned private companies and contracts that screw over BC residents pretty thoroughly, but definitely bc hydro is not u.s owned i'd also like to address the fact that for the first time in four seasons last week i didn't put out an episode and that's just because i'm having trouble getting the quality of audio that i want for these interviews and you can hear the difference between a phone conversation and a properly recorded one in this week's show and actually if because i record a little bit with mark sullivan over the phone before he turns his recorder on um so if you don't want to hear that part you can skip to about five minutes and that will (laughs) i'm just saying you can do that if you want mark sullivan does the snowboard project podcast with his co-host the beeve i listen to their show and i enjoy it so i called him up to find out more Hello? Mark. Hey, how's it going? It's going good. How's uh, how's audio on your side? You can hear me? I can hear you, yeah. I mean, I have to just put on my headphones and put you on the headphones and then turn on my Zoom and, and record, you know? What um, what recorder do you use? You use the same thing I'm using? A Zoom? Like, Is that what you use? Yeah, like a, an H5 or something. H6, I think. Yeah, that's exactly what I got. Yeah. Yeah, they're nice, hey. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it makes all the difference in it, in being able to like record like uh, good quality audio, you know. Yeah, did you? I mean, you could really tell the difference. I was recording on Skype before, and it just it wasn't really. When I started getting comments like, "Yeah, I listened to the first ten minutes, and I just couldn't bear the noise," <laughs> it's like, ah. Uh, I feel the same way. You know. Yeah. Anytime that I do one over the phone, I'm like, yeah. I have to, like, if I listen back to it, I have to, like, allow myself to get into that fantasy that I'm right. on the and phone. you do get into it after a few minutes. Yeah, totally. You know? Totally. So what was what was your first board? I got to ask that for <laughs> listeners like, hey, you don't ask that anymore. Let's where, mm. You sound like you were, you started first. 80, like early 80s, mid 80s. Uh, 80, mid-80s, 86. Yeah, yeah. It's a... I would say my first board was a Burton Express 175. Wow. I don't even know what that is. You're blowing yeah, my it's, mind. It's a Burton race board they made for like one year. Yeah. Didn't really have side cut. It just had paper. It was like based on a mono ski design. One of the worst designed boards ever, probably. <laughs> but... How old were you? But it's probably one of the most rare Burtons ever as well. Yeah. How old were you? Were you just a kid? Or it sounds like you'd be a man. Yeah, I was a little kid. I was 14. And you got a 175. My first pro board was a Avalanche Kick yeah. 175. So it it was yeah. way bigger than me. and But I loved it because it was a pro board. And because Damien Sanders, yeah. like, 
Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had, I had rented a board before that. Like, I had ridden The Sims before that, like, as a rental. Yeah. And and that was actually the first board I got. Burton was pretty much like, uh, you know, on the East Coast, they pretty much called it Burton boarding back then. Yeah, they, you know? they actually did at some point, right? Like, it was Burton boarding was like... Well, yeah, well, you know, it, that was really the skier's perception of it, mm. right? I mean, everyone who was actually a snowboarder knew it wasn't called Burton boarding. If you didn't know it wasn't, it wasn't called Burton boarding. You weren't playing the same game I was. Right. You know? I started '88, and I feel like maybe because of where I was, we didn't really look back. I didn't start looking back at the history of snowboarding or being nostalgic until basically. Hey. Oh, oh. Hey, Eric, yeah. let, me, let me stop you for a second. Are we recording the interview right now? Because I haven't started recording on mine. Yeah, start recording. All right. Hi, Death. Here nice. we go. Okay, I'm here. Sick. Right on, Mark. Oh. Well, thanks for agreeing to do this with me. I, I know I reached out right, right away when I first saw maybe the pre-episode, like explaining what you were going to do. And I, I was like, all right, welcome to the gang, you know? And then I was like, holy shit, three a week? You're going to do three a week. I can't believe it. Yeah. Like, that's ambitious, yeah. man. That's ambitious. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, is my plan initially was to do five a week. And so, basically, I recorded enough episodes before I even started to yeah. do five a week until the end of the year. And wow. then I launched. Wow. And, uh, and so, I recorded all those episodes. But then what I realized is after releasing, I don't know, maybe like 10 episodes, mm -hmm. that people have a hard time dedicating four or five hours a week to listening to just snowboarding podcasts. You're burning. Yeah, you're burning a lot of episodes quick, too, right? Like, you're like, oh, my God. I'm going to how like, yeah, that happened to me the first year I was the first year I didn't even do it. The first year I wanted to do it, I didn't. I was like, I'm going to do this. And I just sat on it. And then I bought the recorder. Oop, I better turn off my phone notifications. I bought a recorder and I had it with me at Mount Baker. And I saw Sean Farmer in the parking lot. He just slept in his truck and he's like taking his dog for a walk. And he's got that like just woke up stretch kind of face eyes like and I go, hey, Sean. I'm the guy who sent you, you know, those Facebook messages. And he looks at me blankly like, dude, I don't, I'm not even on Facebook. And then I'm like, I do a podcast. Do you want to, could I record with you? And he's like, yeah, sure. And I was like, yes. And I recorded with him on the chairlift. <laughs> and then I was like, now, nice. I, now I have to do something. So I didn't know where to start. So I ended up going all the way back to Sherman and Dimitri and just calling those dudes yep. up on the phone and building an episode out of that. And then I had to learn how to fucking put it on the, on the internet. And I did that in a weekend and launched one and went like, wow, great. That's a, finally, I, I got one. And yep. then I was like, there, there's I, a I, lot to it though. Yeah. There, there is a lot to it to get it right. You oh know what God, I mean? Totally. And then I realized I had to do one a week. Like I'd committed to one a week. And I just was like really under the gun every week to just get it out there on time. And I said, the next year yeah. I'm going to do what you did, which was record a whole bunch in advance. I did that. And then I didn't get into that scramble mode until uh, into January or February and then pulled it off by the end of the year. And then, you know, this year I was like <laughs> I had episode one recorded, but episode two, I had to get it ready in a week, man. It's crazy. Right, right. Mm -hmm. You know, and we're still scrambling sometimes because, like, we'll be like, oh, man, w this is like, uh, you know, we're trying to, like, interview all sorts of different people with all different backgrounds. And sometimes we're like, oh, man, well, we need more chicks, let's say, for instance. Yeah. And it's, so it's like, oh, we're, we're going to slot someone in. We're going to, you know, interview them and, and get them in two weeks from now or a week from now or something, mm -hmm. you know. And then working but, with people's uh, but it does change. isn't always easy, huh? Yeah, I mean, especially during snowboard season, it's like, oh, yeah, that's right. Everyone's snowboarding every day that's decent, right? <laughs> yeah. And so it's like in the summertime, it's actually pretty easy. You're just like, hey, what are you doing? Yeah. Oh, I'm just going surfing, hanging out. Hey, you got time to record it? Sure. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. But it, this time of year, it's a little different. 
Right, totally. Yeah, I should remember that so. next year and get a bunch of stuff stacked for the winter and the summer. Because, yeah, I heard your Rob Kingwell one, and I'd just been up there for the drink water. And I was like, shit, I should yeah. I should have talked to that guy. He's a fucking legend, man. I'd, yeah. Yeah. I I do all these trips, and then, you know, you start snowboarding or doing other things, and you're tracking down one guy. For me, it's tough, because as soon as I've, you know, I had Terrier in Banff this year and he comes mm-hmm. to breakfast to meet me for the morning and he brings Nicholas Mueller and I'm like, oh, fuck, I don't want to be rude and be like, hey, Nico, you want to do one too? You know what I mean? Because that's going to insult yeah. Terrier because now he's not, you know what I mean? So I, I that happened to me early on too at Russell Winfield's house. Mike uh, LeBlanc was there and I was like, oh, damn, I really want a mic yeah. one. <laughs> Yeah, you're like, uh, Russell, uh, I don't need you right now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad that I didn't do it. I'm glad I didn't, like, I I really respected Russell. It was at his house. Of course I got to respect the guy. And um, I was glad I did it because he was a really interesting dude to talk to. And we've remained yeah. friends after. He's a nice guy. That's the thing for me. Yeah. Is like I was never in the industry other than, like, a shop guy. So I would go to SIA and see... You know, the pros that would go to SIA, see Jamie Lynn gambling sure. in a cowboy hat or whatever. But you were yeah. you were in the thick of it, right? Like you were you worked at Transworld during those glory years. Yeah, I was a snowboarder, actually. Oh, sorry, I was snowboarder. on snowboarder. And back then we were like dogs and cats, right? Yeah. Like snowboarder and Transworld. We didn't it's not that we didn't respect them. We absolutely respected everyone who was dedicating themselves to snowboarding. But it was like we were competitive, too. Oh, yeah. You know, and so we wanted to win, you know, which to us meant, you know, either more ads or more distribution or getting a a key interview or whatever. Yeah. And uh, but, yeah, I mean, from I guess I first went to SIA as a teenager. And so I was like a wannabe sponsored kid. I was sponsored, but not to like the pro level. Right. And, you know, at that first, you know, SIA that I went to as like, I don't know. 18 17 18 years old i was like walking around the trade show and talking to the sponsors i had and trying to get a couple new ones and i realized like man there's like thousands of people here who have actual jobs doing this <laughs> i didn't even know before that that like you could actually have a job there was an industry even yeah. you know and so and then i was like man i gotta figure out a way to like to have a reason to come back here every year and not just like oh will you sponsor me i'm rad right you know and so the next year I brought my first zine to the trade show still as a teenager. And, uh, and then the rest, it kind of like that second year, the first zine was like a hit at the trade show. And so from there on in, it was like, I kind of had a place That's to keep rad. coming back. What year would that yeah. be at the trade show? I 91 see. was probably my first show. This 92 yeah. was probably my first zine. Where were you, where were you going to the show from? Were you in, I Vermont was back still? then I was. No, no, I was in um, I was in Breckenridge. And so basically what I was doing at the time. So my dad had told me my dad was always my dad was an orphan who ended up, um, you know, basically um, he was always fiercely independent, but then realized at a point that he would have to go to college Mm -hmm. and ended up going to college and then Ivy League school for graduate school. And so he was like a really smart guy. And so he was always into education. And so he was trying to push me not towards snowboarding. In fact, there was a certain point in time when my parents disowned me because I just wanted to snowboard. (laughs) And uh, but anyhow, I still had in the back of my mind, they had beat it into me enough where I was like going to school in the fall and the summer and then and then living in Breck in the in during the winter semester and pursuing kind of my pro rider dreams back then. And so right. I was like filming for videos and competing in contests and and just sponsors? doing I mean, riding every day. Yeah, uh, I rode for mm, back then I rode for LibTech. Um, wow. I rode for LibTech. I rode for who did I ride? I rode for Twist Clothing. Damn. Um, I rode for Arnett Goggles. <laughs> yep. Um, 
I don't know. I probably had a couple of other sponsors too, but really, I mean, okay. So these are like product sponsorships, right? These aren't like, yeah. hey, I get a check every month from LibTech. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it was still pretty cool to get boards before anyone else. And honestly, back then, LibTechs didn't last a long time. That's so true. the fact that you could like ride a, a LibTech for like two or three weeks and break it, and then get another <laughs> one for free, that's really that was a more important thing. And they were like a, a higher performance snowboard back then because they were like lighter. Yeah. significantly than anything else on the market yeah they were really good back in those in the early 90s they were significantly better yeah yeah unless you were buying them with cash in which case you had to be like growing drugs or something <laughs> <laughs> to afford them <laughs> you know but uh yeah people people love those yeah and so i still have a couple of them actually i've held on to a couple of them i have from back in my uh my lib tech days, the flower top sheets, and I have nice. a couple of like art top sheet boards that I held on to that oh, were made for are, me. Yeah, it's so. funny because those are really valuable. But um, I worked for the distributor in Canada, and he would go either he would talk with the with Mike over the phone or go down to the factory, and Mike would just take anything that they had left over and put an art top on it, and we would sell those as special makeup boards, right? Like so. We, yep. would, we would get those for cheap and we would sell them the next year as a like, hey, this is just like a rando. It's not affiliated in the right. line board. And so we sold those at a discount. So around Vancouver, right. we sold stacks and stacks of those art tops, like Nick Russian art yep. tops, like the chick, like just like the a big brush stroke down of multicolors. And there's yep. got to be hundreds of those around the lower mainland. But like when one pops up on like, uh, you know, like the vintage lib collectors thing, like how much is this worth? People are like, I don't know, two thousand dollars. I'm like, God. right. I got to go around and try and find some of these in people's garages. But that's great. That yeah. You have some. You still have you. I didn't keep anything. I just it was so hand to mouth. The whole time. And, yeah. and like I was saying in the beginning, I didn't have any nostalgia for anything. You know what I mean? Like we were always looking to the future. Like last year's lib tax, fuck that shit. You want to have not even this year's. You want to have next year's. Yeah. Well, back then it's like every year there was like a significant amount of progress in terms mm -hmm. of the technology that was being in, injected into the sport. So if you were riding last year's board, you were riding something totally obsolete. Mm -hmm. This year's board, questionably obsolete. <laughs> Next year's board, okay, there we go. You right? would hear the reps say it in the shop. They would be showing you this year's line for the PK, but they'd already seen next year's. And they'd have to bite their tongue so hard to not be like, oh, this is going to be so much better next year because we're in the shop and we got a stack of this year's that we have to sell to people. We can't tell them, right. you know, hold off a year and get next year's because, yeah, it's crazy that the, the, the snowboard industry did that until it couldn't, but we still wanted the next thing. That's where step-ins kind of came in right at that exact moment where I was like, all right, let's yeah. jump on the step-in thing. Because this is obviously going to be that big future thing. And it, it took up, I don't know, 30% of the market in two years or something? Like, what? Right. And then two years later, it was 0%. Like, zero. I've never seen anything yeah. do that before where it was like, this is the next best thing. Everybody's touting it. And then <laughs> pro riders are like, I'm going back to strap bindings. These things don't work. They never did. Yeah, I mean that's a, I mean that's like a case in point of like people who work in the office and don't spend enough time on the mountain developing product. I think, because while yeah. while the interfaces worked, like okay, wow, I can step right in. Yeah, right. It's like the interfaces did work for like the switch you could step into the, you know, the Burton SI you could step into. I mean, all of them device you could step into. However, once you got riding, it was like a compromise in performance performance and the flex <laughs> totally. patterns of the boots were all wonky and like and once you were actually riding it was like oh man this i can't wait to get back on my strap bindings yeah yeah i remember in the sh at the shop level for the years leading up to that i would say and i i still stand by this right now like if you are coming cold to snowboarding you should get a good pair of boots that's your first that's like your first obligation yep. to yourself is get like a really nice pair of boots 
that fits well and that you could stand in and walk around in for eight hours because you're going to be out there in the cold with these boots and they're really going to dictate how your day goes. But as soon as you get to like step in boots, you find yourself saying like, okay, so there's a pinch point, but that's better than the other one for that system, right? (laughs) Like you've only got two choices. So we're going with pinchy in the toe as opposed to heel lift on the heel. <laughs> it, right. It just didn't work. Like you it, it was one of those like wait till next year there's like four other pairs of boots. I actually had that happen in an interview like about the Burton stuff where mm-hmm. Mark Frank Montoya says, you know, step in I quit snowboarding when I had to when I signed that contract cuz I couldn't snowboard anymore. The boots fucking sucked. And then I, I yep. we went on a step in rant and I said, actually, the Burton rep, when I talk about step-ons with him, he was saying, you know, wait till next year. There's there's more boots that are going to be mm. like kind of your style of boot, you know? And then I called the, the Burton rep to be like, should I put this in the show? I don't want to like throw you under the bus or anything on the step-on thing. And we had a really nice conversation about like the state of step-on. And, uh, and then yeah. in the back of the car... Uh, this voice pops up and it's Dave Downing. He's like loving it, just like being behind the scenes, listening to how people talk about Step On because he's really, you know, behind. He's he's behind that program right now. He's helping design it, right? And it, it's got to be tough at an industry level to not know what is happening on the front lines. Like when I see people on S- Step On stuff now, they're carving up a storm, but they don't have it's not a freestyle boot it still isn't it's the same as before right but we can't be so myopic to imagine that everybody in the world is a pro rider or an aspiring pro rider for a lot of people step on is the right thing well if the boots are comfortable and it makes it more convenient and it's not too much of a sacrifice of performance but you know when i look at like the step ons it's like I don't see Chloe Kim riding step-ons. Right. I don't see, you know, Danny Davis riding step-ons. If right. it's like if every pro rode step-ons by choice, right. I would be like, okay, maybe they actually have done this. And believe you me, I'd get by, to the bottom of whether it was by choice or check. <laughs> You're right, but uh, yeah. but because uh, that was the problem before. It's like Mark Frank rode uh, rode the switch bindings, yep. but it was for a check. You it know, a hundred percent for a check. And Lance Pippen even said it as well. Like he was getting pressured by K2 because they were moving forward with the clicker and he was he he couldn't even be in the room. And maybe I'm misquoting him, but it it felt like uncomfortable to say, you know what? I don't want to ride that shit. It doesn't work for what I'm doing. There, there's a bunch of people who, like, in the dead period, like when, when Steppen's made up 0% of the market, yeah. I know a handful of people who, like, swore by clickers. Yeah, Only clickers. No, not none of the other systems. No one's stuck by Switch or any of the other ones. But, me like, too. people would literally be, like, just, like, combing eBay yeah. looking for another set of clicker boots. Yeah. And I was kind of always just scratching my head, like... <laughs> uh, <laughs> You know these didn't work when they were new. <laughs> <laughs> they work for some people. I, I, yes, I've had that same yeah. experience, and I'm one of the weirdos that rides those ride one strap bindings that have been uh-huh. discontinued five years ago or whatever. I just I find yep. it really f- nice to just click in with one ratchet. I just do whenever I'm in like a toe strap situation. It, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know if I'm lazy. I just I like what I like, and I look at it like a, a classic car, right? You could, when I was a kid growing up, my uncle had an El Camino, and damn, that thing was old, but it was fucking so cool. You know what I mean? And it worked for him. So that's I I right. see my bindings kind of like that. People will sometimes say like, "Damn, your bindings are old, man." <laughs> I'm like, well, they work for what I do. I like them. So I could see it. Somebody swearing by. S- especially switch or um sorry clickers clicker that they paid you know nine hundred dollars for the boot and binding it's expensive yeah. shit and it and it did work to a certain degree yeah i mean i think it, it really depended if you were trying to be like a freestyle rider tweaking out airs or whatever <laughs> that was not your pick 
<laughs> but if you were like just carving and kind of keeping, uh, you know, the board to the snow, then maybe that works for you, I guess. Yeah. Did you ride hard, hard plates on, on what was that first board? That you said you rode. What was it? Called? Oh, Burton? that was Burton Express. Burton Express one seventy five was Express. my first board, and I, I, yeah, and no, it had like what what we called back then Darth Vader bindings, which were like the first um, Burton bindings that actually had ratchets. Three Before straps. that, they had fast X clips. Yeah, three, so they had straps. Yeah, three straps, and and the third strap was a part of the high back, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I no the third strap I don't think I even used. I think you could bolt it on or take it off. And oh, then they had like accessories like Ford lean pads and yeah. who knows what else. Man, but, Bur- um, Burton was just such the number one company for such a long time. Hey, with we were just talking yeah. Terry was reminding me of the canting plates and just you oh, know yeah. remember just how great Burton bindings were even cuz uh, uh Jimmy Scott told me early 90s probably that Burton was just taking input from all the riders not just Burton riders because a lot of companies right. only made boards so like you could be a yeah. top tier rider and you'd you'd be on your own for bindings and Burton would just like hook up anybody that was you know top 10 or something but then also yeah. pick their brain about it so you'd be riding for the competition but Still giving your feedback to Burton for for the bindings, so their bindings were so good. Yeah, I would say there weren't really anything that could actually compete with Burton bindings until, gosh, maybe Union. Even you know, I mean, really, it's like there there was a, a handful of little you know Tech Nine bindings were pretty good, yeah. um, but not never to the same level as Burton though. You know, and like there was a bunch of other brands. I think Ride got close. I think. I liked yep. the idea of ride with the kind of more rigid aluminum base plate versus right. the plastic or or softer um, Burton, you know, in the in the mid grade stuff. Anyways, in the mid range yeah. bindings. But I worked for Boardroom. Boardroom didn't carry any Burton stuff, so you had to, you know, we were yep. always chasing what what innovations were out there that would be comparable or better. There really was that Burton, you know, we could, we hated on Burton. Just like, oh, I hear they make other shops carry 70% Burton stuff, but not by choice. You're not allowed to just, like, pick and choose. you got to have mostly Burton. Right. Well, that was just based on a minimum order. Mm-hmm. Burton would set up minimum orders and, like, be like, oh, you got to order 500 grand this year. Wow. Right? You're and like, so if that's well, 75% of your uh, inventory, there it is. That's it. Yeah. And they but were- at least you know it's going to sell through. You know, yeah, yeah. See, I didn't know anything about. I still don't know much about Burton's. You know, wholesale, retail, because we just never dealt with them. We we had Forum. Right. Forum was going crazy for us, and then they bought Forum. So that was the first business. And I say we like as though I'm the boardroom. I'm I'm not, but I was a part of the buying team. So I remember being like, okay, that's <laughs> they they've got us. One of our big brands is now a Burton brand, so we have to deal with Burton. They were professional, obviously. I talked about it with Terry a, yeah. coming around to the Burton idea, back around to it, because when I was a kid, I loved Burton. Yeah. yeah. Did you what what companies did you work for before uh, Snowboarder? Mm, Snowboarder was like, I mean, that was like my first real job out of college. Rad. Um. And so basically I was making a magazine when I was going to call a zine, not a magazine, a zine, let's call it. Yep. It was actually printed on an offset press. So it was professional quality as far as like it was printed on a real printing press, not a photocopy machine. But cool. by the same token, you know, it was nothing like Transworld of the day. We weren't doing a lot of drum scans or stuff like that. Right. But I did that when I was going to school full time and... um and so I did that in college. I was making that zine. I had actually made a zine in Colorado before I went back to UVM to finish college. And uh, and then was like, okay, well, if I'm, my brain is smarter than my knees, then I'm going to use my brain in snowboarding. And so I just kept making zines. And then as soon as I graduated, um, I actually got, I applied to both Transworld and Snowboarder, and I got job offers for both. Whoa. And I actually got two job offers at Snowboarder at the time, which was like, do you want to be in sales or do you want to be an editorial? 
And I didn't even know the difference because I did it all when I was making zines. I would sell the ads and write the stories and take the photos even. What was do the, the layout, name of, you your, know? of your zine? The, the first one I made in Colorado was called Player. Yeah. And then the second one was called East Infection. And I made that with Pat Bridges. Pat Sick. Bridges was kind of like my partner in crime on that. That's um, amazing. And so, yeah, so that's uh, that's what I did when I was going to college. When I like came back from Colorado, my winter semesters in Colorado, I did my last like year and a half of college straight through, and so that's when I like started maybe two years of college. I did the last two straight through, and then just made that zine and had uh, <clears throat> pretty amazing actually how many people who were involved with East Infection who are still involved with the industry. Um, you know, obviously Pat Bridges is that snowboarder, but. Um, but like uh, my sales guy for that zine was uh, Herb George, and Herb George is the um, like the global creative director for Globe Shoes, wow. and then uh, Ev- Evan Rose, who um, who wrote a column in that, is now the creative director for Burton. Um, George Kovala, who was my photo editor. Um, now works at 686 mike garzina who is a guy who did sales um at that as well he now works at burton um in the marketing department somewhere and so basically everybody who was uh heavily involved with east infection is still involved heavily with snowboarding to this day i I remember zines in the early 90s being yeah like subversive and cool but not like professional i remember you know, mm. <laughs> there was a dude that made one in Ontario, Brad Hangshwang. He runs a shop now up there. And yeah. you get your hand on them. They'd sometimes be free in a shop or whatever, and you'd be like, this is fucking cool. What was the format of, of East Infection? East Infection was 8.5 by 11 like uh, regular magazine size. So that's why it was more like magazine-ish. But, like, the, uh, you know, we were just figuring it all out. You That's know, fun. we were just figuring it all out. So, like, at first we were printing black and white, and then we went to color, and then we had to figure out how to get the colors to look right, and we had to figure out everything That's kind incredible. of just for ourselves. And that was that was a great experience, actually, just having to make those mistakes before there was as much money on the line as been on the line since, right? Yeah. It's like you can kind of afford to make those mistakes at, at the grassroots level. And uh, once you get professional, once you've made those mistakes once, you're not going to make them again. That's important. Yeah, so obviously you chose editorial. Was there a reason? I did. Yeah, I'm a snowboarder. Yeah. I'd be basically I've defined myself as a snowboarder. I'm like uh, I was a sponsored athlete and like – you know, the sales guys are are kind of, um, you know, they they shake babies and kiss ladies and the and the editorial guys, they get to go ride. Yeah. And that's what they told me. The difference is like, do you want to make money or do you want to go riding on cool trips? And I was like, I want to go on the cool trips. <laughs> and so like almost immediately I went to like New Zealand and Alaska and Europe and like all these places I had dreamed about going as a rider. But, you know, my ability as a sponsored athlete, they would have never sent me to Alaska. Right. You know, but. But being working for the magazine, um, I certainly knew exactly how to appreciate Alaska once I got there. Rad. Rad. Yeah, that's the dream, right, is to somehow I, – I was sort of similar with – I had aspirations of being a pro rider. But once I found out what the job was, I was like, well, that's a lot more work than I was thinking. So I, yeah. I really did enjoy doing sales at the shop at the boardroom and it and actually fairly early on I was offered like a management like a co manager of the shop thing that I turned down saying like, No, I'm a snowboarder. Like if I'm managing, I gotta be here all the time. I I was actually I went to like the interview to become a manager and said left the interview saying like I wanna own, I wanna work less. I don't care how much you're paying me I need to snowboard more. Like I'm working five days a week. I want to be working four or three and I'm going to be right. a pro rider or whatever. I still thought that at that time. And, uh, yeah. And it, it's funny to hear you talk about it, um, doing your own zine and taking the initiative because back in those days, you really would have a lot to choose from when you were picking, um, employees for a shop or, you know, people for, uh, for companies you 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 wanted to go with the guy who had the 
passion. I learned that at that moment. The guy who took over as the manager of the shop, I didn't agree with that um, decision. But he told the owner of the store, I've always wanted to manage a store. It's something I've thought about my whole life. You know, as I'm like, really? I never thought about being a manager of a store. That sounds fucking way, lame. Way to aim low, buddy. Yeah, but no, you know what? The thing was that he turned out to be a really, really good manager. And he and he switched yeah. the shop into something that if I had become co-manager with him, it I would have held it back for a year or two. Like he brought in skateboarding. He brought in shoes. He brought in lifestyle stuff. Stuff that I was right. like, I only gave a shit about hard goods, really. When it came to snowboarding, I was like, I don't care what clothes I'm wearing. I, you know, I want good boots. I want like a fucking rad board. But he he really uh, had the vision for what a snowboard shop could be when there really yeah. weren't any at that time. So, But yeah, my point being, like, who would you hire to be editorial at a magazine? Somebody who had the passion to make their own zine or... Or just some dude who's like, I want a job, and I think I could do that. You know what I mean? You obviously go, yeah. okay, the guy who's doing it, you would have done it anyway. You were doing the job that you were applying for anyway, which that's awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so how long yeah, did you Yeah, I don't know how there? good I was at the job, but uh, <laughs> I certainly learned. And the thing is, like, when I was making my own zines, it's like I was doing the graphic design, photography, layout, sales, distribution. I did all of it, right, to yeah. some degree. Yeah. I was involved in every aspect of it. And once I got to Snowboarder, it's like, okay, perfect. You need to write this feature this month. Right. And it's like, well, I've written lots of words on paper. I went to college. I graduated. Right. Yeah. They made me write all sorts of papers. And so really, <laughs> once once my job got narrowed down to being a single cog in the machine instead of like 50 different cogs, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I think it got a lot easier, actually. I would say that actually the making a zine in college was much more challenging than working at Snowboarder. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. You know, my cousin, Steve Metcalf. And I, yeah, I, totally. I, I knew him as a snowboarder when we were kids. He lived in northern Ontario. He lived like kind of the Ottawa Valley. I lived in Sudbury. So our families would visit at Christmas and whatnot. And, uh, but then when we moved out west, he became like the editor for Powder Magazine. So like, right. I knew he could go back and forth between skiing and snowboarding. But at that time, I was kind of like, oh, fuck, he traded sides and sell out yeah sell out total (laughs) sell out and then i read one of his you know like the editor opens the magazine i read only one time did i ever read a powder magazine editorial and that was something steve wrote and i was like holy shit i could never do this writing those words it was very eloquent and really made me want to go out into the mountains as a snowboarder just reading you know what I mean? Like, oh, I've been with yeah. him all summer for the first turns of the year or whatever. And then he described where he had yeah. gone. And I was like, that's brilliant. That That's fucking yeah. cool. So you knew him. Though. I mean, you well, that's kind of your job now is doing that same thing. I mean, you're now like one of the official ambassadors of Stoke of the sport. <laughs> sort right. Of, Whether you yeah. like it or not, you're trying to get people excited about snowboarding and sharing your passion for it and your yeah, excitement true. for it. Is, uh, you know, it's the same kind of thing. And so whether, you know, and by the way, it's like when I was doing that and when Steve Metcalf was doing that, because I, I was the editor of Snowboarder when he was the editor of Powder. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's like each one of those columns, you would spend like a day or two days or three days trying to get these you know, a couple hundred words just right. Mm -hmm. And obviously it's a lot different when you're doing a podcast. It's like whatever comes out of your mouth goes up. Mm -hmm. But, um, but certainly, you know, you were really still, it's the same idea of like, we're trying to get people excited about snowboarding or skiing in his case. But like, you know, I'm trying to get people stoked to go ride. Yeah. So what's your relationship with skiing? Did you ever ski as a kid? I did. I was a ski racer. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and then I and then I discovered snowboarding and basically never looked back. I have been skiing, I guess, twice since 1986. <laughs> so that um, that pretty much counts. I as do. Zero, I do. Yeah. Admittedly, I do have a pro model ski. What? 
What the hell is that? Yeah, for Tailgate Alaska, actually. It's like uh, this European ski company yep. um, made some skis uh, that I helped design for um, for Tailgate Alaska or whatever. So, so I do when have did a... you start doing Tailgate Alaska? Because from the Ooh. only the only info that I have about Tailgate Alaska is my exposure to it through the magazines. It looks like a really fun event. And then from Kevin Jones <laughs> telling me, he's like, Fuck that guy, man. Tailgate Alaska, you can't have a you can't charge a hundred bucks for me to park in a parking lot. I've been going here my whole life and he just sounded really angry and upset. Okay, first of all, he's wrong. Straight up he's wrong. And here's why. It's because we provide amenities that he that, that would cost him far more than a hundred dollars to get on his own right, if he was right, doing it right. independently. Right? It's like, oh, you want Wi Fi in the parking lot? Guess what? You can't even buy that for any price. I arranged it for everybody. Oh, bathrooms on the mid- in the middle of Thompson Pass? Guess what? I provide bathrooms. Oh, right. bands playing on the middle of Thompson Pass in the middle of the backcountry. I provide that too. Right. Snow safety education. How about a free thousand dollars worth of snow safety education? Rad. Right? Oh, yeah. You don't get that for, for parking in the free parking lot. Right. So the thing is, it's like, you know what? You're deluding yourself if you think that you can just go park for free because it ends up costing you way more. Right. Okay. Right. And honestly, the, the reason why Tailgate is there is to make Alaska accessible to more people and to share those mountains. Right. And yeah. and granted, like, you know, you can go park up there for free. People can still go park up there for free. But it's a lesser experience. Right. And having all of those knowledgeable people around, having snow safety education, bathrooms, Wi-Fi, entertainment, it all matters. Having a food truck. Right. Right. right like right, being right. able to go to a food truck, getting coffee in the morning. OK, that's that's pretty nice, too. You know, yeah, you got so <laughs> so it's like or you can be camped out in a tent and be cold right. and, you know, get your jet boil going to yeah. get your Folgers crystals warm. Right. Well, right. But uh, we're talking about a guy yeah. who's been going there since before all this. Right. Like, so I was just up in a place I can't name on the show. The locals oh, there, I've been there are so fucking local. Oh, and so be careful. And so angry and really mean even to each other you know what i mean it's like oh you went right. to that zone today i w- i told you last oh. week i was thinking about going there oh and, man yeah i've you know the the craziest localism stories i've heard have come out of I, actually in snowboarding i would say they're they're a hundred percent true they the 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 feeling up there is let's protect this from the outside 100%. Yeah. And, and I went to I went to Honolulu and stayed in Waikiki, not Waikiki, but just up in the proper city with a full-blooded Hawaiian as our host in 93. And he told us, you know, what we had to do in order to, like, deal with the harsh localism that was going on at the time. And, you know, right. we basically just said we were there as a guest of him, right? And, and people right. would would be like oh okay well all right howley you know we'll leave you alone we're not going to beat you up but you see what happened in on the north shore and you see what happened in hawaii in general and you understand like oh well maybe we should have some places where i don't know though maybe not it's so hard to justify people being dicks to anyone else just based on like I yeah. I was here first, and I want that for me or whatever. Well, but it's government. Well, that plans. that's kind of that was actually one of the, like the the foundations of Tailgate Alaska was based on the fact that this place is so gnarly and so good mm-hmm. that like that that um, snowboarding can't afford to have that that surfing localism like that Santa Cruz local mentality mm-hmm. or that you know North Shore of Oahu local mentality, mm-hmm. and certainly. Alaska could have gotten that, but instead, um, tailgate, I think was actually a part of this is like having people, um, from Alaska, welcoming people from all over the world and treat them like family. Right. And that is one of the foundation vibes of like tailgate is like, share it with more people, whether you're Alaskan, whether you're, whether you're from Europe or Japan or anywhere, it's like the job of the event is to share these mountains with people. And so everyone is looking out for everyone else. And whether you're from Alaska or anywhere else, it doesn't matter. You've got a property up there now too, right? Like, so you can. I do. Like, you've got like a like a long term Alaska plan, I would imagine, right? And that's, I mean, it's yeah. really noble of you to be 
to be creating a sense of community up there. How long is how long has tailgate been been going? It's it's years this, now, right? Yeah, this is going on year twelve. Twelve. So we're yeah, yeah. going back to like in two thousand six, completely different energy in the in the even up in Alaska, right? Well, that's fun. That's cool. What when is tailgate? The last Friday, it's a Friday to a Sunday. I believe this year it's March 28th to like April 8th. Yeah. It's always kind of that last weekend of March, the first week of April. And people like and that's drive that's pretty up much the prime time. Yeah. Yeah. People drive up, they fly up, they, yeah. they go. At, the whole thing with tailgate is, is basically it creates um, an a la carte menu of options. Yeah. And so well, you could, I've had people literally show up with $20 in their pocket for a week. And I'm like, what are you stupid? And they're <laughs> like, yeah, I brought my Walmart tent. I brought, I brought my Walmart sleeping bag. Where can I stay? And it's like, oh, wow. you could bring your own place to stay or whatever. But anyhow, people end up taking care of each other because yeah. of someone's in need. Everyone kind of looks out for everyone else. That's but right. yeah, I've had a guy come up with literally $20 cash. Flew up from San Diego, I might add, oh which is God. like, really? You're not even acclimated to this cold, <laughs> you know, Ch- chattered, chattered, his teeth chattered himself to sleep every night in that tent. How, you know, how much of the event is partying in a parking lot and how much of the event is riding wicked mountains? It, it really depends on the year, you know, I mean, 100 percent of the time that it's bluebird, 100 percent of those bluebird days is 100 percent snowboarding. Mm-hmm. Right. And then. You know, the um, the partying just happens on the down days. That's right. like when people don't have anything to do. And and honestly, it's all above tree line. So it's not like you can go really do too much when it comes to riding. A lot of people will build like quarter pipes or they'll build jumps in the parking lot or on banks and stuff. And there'll be little sessions yeah. kind of at the base of the mountain. But really, you can't see anything. Right. You know, in the in the actual mountains. So basically you're grounded. Yeah. And so, yeah, people will party generally. I mean, I would say people, you know, it's it's not really about the party. The party is a byproduct and people blowing off steam. Yeah. And when you're taking your life into your hands and you're like, I could be I'm willing to die doing what I love. You better believe people want to blow off steam as well. Yeah. So there is some partying going on. I don't think. It, uh, and here's the thing. Knock on wood. But, you know, no one's ever been killed. There hasn't even been a fist fight during tailgate and right. with 500 people in the middle of the backcountry camped out for, you know, 10 days at a stretch. That's you incredible. Know? So, yeah. So really, it's a very peaceful and, uh, you know, every everyone gets along. Yeah, I would say in general. So it, it's actually a really cool um, way for people to kind of get to dip a toe in the water of Alaskan riding. Yeah, that's rad, dude. That's, have you talked about it on your podcast at all? Do you put it out there? As a, um, as a I, I do a little bit. I mean, I've interviewed a bunch of people who've been to the event, so we yeah. it comes up from time to time. Rad. But, you know, I mean, I think that people will get the picture that, you know, I think people already have the picture that some of the best snowboarding on the planet is Alaska. Yeah. And this is kind of the easy way into Alaska, you yeah. know, and that's what I hope people get out of it. That's fucking and awesome. So, and it's for everybody, by the way. It's like people also have this idea that like, oh, I got to be a pro or I got to be, yeah. you know, just gnarly or what. It's like, no, you don't. Anyone can do it. If you like powder, then you can do Alaska. 70% of the terrain is intermediate, oh, you know. Wow. That's rad. Yeah. yeah, we just yeah, did it's just... catboarding in Galena, Great Northern Snowcats. Supposedly, these guys are like the second oldest cat operation on the planet. And they had some fucking... Yeah. I'd, I'd say the steep stuff that we rode there was just like all time, man. Like just subalpine in these like burnt forest trees and like oh, yeah. super steep sections that... Just you know, I've I've done heli with the Monashies with CMH, and I've done uh, heli and Whistler and Whistler backcountry sledding, mm-hmm. and this was some all time terrain. Just really, really yeah. fun to ride. And there's nothing better yeah. than deep snow, and also like taking that pressure off to be the you know snow safety person for yourself. You're, these, right. th- this operation is professional they did all their homework and we didn't ride anything that was you know we rode some stuff that sloughed about 20 centimeters on top and but w- it, we knew it was going to do that before we even dropped in because the guide was just so on it and it was it made for such a fun day man I just love <laughs> and who doesn't 
love riding like amazing terrain and deep snow. It's the best. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the idea that, you know, and that's kind of what I've done over, over the course of, I don't know, 32 or 33 years for 34 years. Right. I don't know how many years, a bunch of years riding. Yeah. It's like, I started on the East Coast, and I have gradually um, cut the ice days out of my life over 30 <laughs> years to the point where a majority of my riding is powder, right. you know, and uh, and good terrain. And so, I and, and, you know, I have a local hill here. I live, like, right at the foot of a ski area, so that's pretty cool. And so I get to go up pretty much any given day. But uh, I would say that, you know, my goal has always been to, you know, ride quality as well and not just ride, not just be like, man, that was, I just conquered that day. It was negative 50. (laughs) You know, it's like, I I don't, I, uh, you know, I'm a little more fair weather now, you know, as far as like, I want the conditions to be decent. And if it's going to be like, I don't want to be riding like, you know, a resort, uh, you know, at the end of the next day afterwards, when it's like the whole thing is moguled up, that's not my idea of a good time. Right, right. I'm I'm pretty hungry, and I'll go a lot of bad days in a year. You know, like I did a hundred day year last year, and I I've, I've got to say probably only twenty of them were like really good days. So that's yep. that's a lot of you know mediocre days, but right but my local mountains are so small it's easy to have fun so like you go up and you do a you know you know, I'm, I'm definitely sure. not riding moguls like for me the worst day in the world yeah. is going to like a whistler on a day where you know i i'm not up there with somebody who's local i'm just riding with some you know guys from the city and we're and we wind up on you know a 10 mile mogul run or whatever god i hate right. that that's the worst I would way rather be yep. on my local mountains just getting a little bit of, you know, know. building some I, feature, having fun. It, snowboarding it, yeah. for me is always fun. But, of course, if I could, I would only ride epic days for sure. Yeah. but it, Well, I could always have fun in the park, right? I yeah. can always have fun, you know, hitting a jump. Yeah, goofing so. around or, yeah, I, I, I really have a lot of fun. For me, uh, uh, a lot of times the most fun days are – these like mediocre days with like a really good crew of people that's a lot of fun yeah because i was married uh to my first wife for like 12 years and i thought that to be a good dad i had to not snowboard right i had to give up everything that was like me so i rode for like 10 years just by myself (laughs) good days only and i had a lot of fun that was fine but as soon as i started going up with a bunch of a bunch of people i was like oh man snowboarding in the in those early days remember going to a resort and and just seeing someone else on a snowboard you've never met before and then instantly having like a great day just hanging out and they'd show you the mountain sure and we still no, you'd chase them yeah. down yeah, you would chase them down, down yeah. until you caught them yeah and they'd be like hey can i ride the lift with you yeah and they'd be like <laughs> sure I, yeah and, yeah, and then they would show you like, oh, all of a sudden their day or night got better because they're like, oh yeah, let me show you around. Here's, there's some pretty cool stuff here, and then yeah, yep. that was those were those were really amazing days for snowboarding. Those first, you know, I would say the first ten years of me riding, so like eighty eight to ninety eight, those were yeah. You know, no matter where you went, you were you are having a really, really good time. Yep. So let's talk about podcasting. What, what was your first exposure to podcasting? Ooh, boy. I mean, I've known about podcasts for about a decade. I'd say I've listened to your podcast and I've listened to the not snowboarding podcast. Yeah, me too. um, Over the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. I talked to Nate and, and he sent me some shred souls. That guy's a fucking gem, dude. I'm sad yeah, that he no, that guy's awesome. Isn't still doing it actively because he, I, yeah. I look at him as like really the first of the snowboard podcast that I listened to and was like, yeah, this is what I, I just want like one of those a week or two of those a week. That would be fun, right? Yeah. yeah. What about other podcasts? So I listened to those, yeah. but the, the one that really like got me hooked on podcasts is probably Joe Rogan. Yeah, you know, same. listening to that and like listening to some of his interviews and how he would like interview people for like, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes. But then like after about an hour, hour and a half of him interviewing, you're like, wow, I had no idea you could go so deep with an interview. Yeah. Yeah. 
He was really so, inspiring for sure. I, I definitely did yeah. like five or eight years of like This American Life and Radio Lab, mm-hmm. like basically just yep. like journalistic storytelling that I, I thought that sure. was I thought that was really rad and I, I wished that I could do that. And actually the first episode of of my podcast was kind of loosely based like on that, right? Telling a story about yep. Sherman and Dimitri and I even have, you know, uh, Scott Surface in there talking about board collecting. But, I mean, This American Life is run by like, a, I don't know, a dozen people or a, a team people or something doing right. editing these no, Beef, shows. Beef down. wants to do that with our podcast. He wants to do like deep dives on like what's wrong with the X Games or Olympics and stuff. And it's, it's a great just like, idea. dude. Do you it. know how much editing that is? Oh, you know how hard most. that is to do compared to what we're doing right now? I've been working on a Craig Kelly episode for like five years, dude. Like just the whole right. story about Craig's life and how amazing that like I've talked to the judge that from the Sims versus Burton case. I've got tape mm-hmm. from him. It's so rad. Like I've talked to so many people and it is a really good story. But it's so much editing, and it's so hard to do. It's like you're. It's it's a, yeah. It's nearly impossible to do one radio lab style story that would be interesting the whole way through. You know, I've, hear that, Beav? <laughs> <laughs> I've got one story that I'm going to tell, um, and I'll yeah, I'll tease it on the show for sure. Um, it's about wax and snowboard wax companies, and. Uh, and there's an interesting story that happened in the mid '90s to a smaller wax uh-huh. brand. That it'll be fun. I, I think they're I, all small wax brands. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's some big giants, right? Like Swix and those guys. Are, Hertel or something. Well, it, that's where it started. Hertel. I, I. Okay. He sent me some wax, and I shouted him out on Willie's episode. And you know, Willie's from Bluebird. Uh-huh. And Willie was like, "Right, no, you're not fuck putting, that. You're not putting that kook on there because he's like suing everybody over this all temp thing, right? Like he's patented all temp or copyrighted all temp as a. I'm the really? first guy who did that, right? Really, exactly. And it's like I'm going to talk to him about it just to have tape from him. But that's not the real story. It reminded me of a story from the '90s that my buddy was the rep for a small company that." Anyways, I won't spoil it, but it'll be good. But still, like even those stories coming up with that fun kind of angle. When I interviewed Jess Kamira, I knew basically that her boyfriend had passed away and that it w- mm-hmm. was devastating for her and that it had happened yeah. about 18 months ago. So she might be like keen to talk about it because it would have affected her for sure. But I had no idea her backstory of just how hard she worked in the industry and and how difficult it is for a girl in snowboarding to to be at the top and, and not be sexualized. Because, you know Real talk. We're real yeah, we're we're you know think about Victoria, right? Like I'm trying to get her on yeah. the show. I loved her growing up because her style was good. She had a great turn, and she was a beautiful girl. I met her before. I thought that it was neat that she was dating, you know, Mike Hatchett or whoever, and I kind of maybe had an idea in my head that that would have helped her career. But anyone I've talked to about her said, you know, no, she's a really strong rider. But she was... She Sem- was, Sem- but she was also really cute too. Yeah, she you know, was and and honestly, you have to have both. Yeah, but that's the thing. It's like you know, it's like to me, it's like who's the most misogynistic brand in snowboarding, right? Who would that be? Uh-huh. To me, yeah. it's Roxy. Yeah, yeah, or Reef or something like that. You know, if you would call. Yeah, them. I mean, Roxy. Uh, okay, so Roxy and Reef are separated by a few degrees of separation, but yeah. honestly, show me one unattractive reef athlete right 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 or or one unattractive roxy athlete they don't exist and and you know and so to me it's just like um you know you you have this kind of thing where you're beating the drum of like oh we're empowering women and we're doing this but it's like no you're actually 
helping objectify women. Totally. You're the one who's being misogynistic in here. Right. And, uh, and actually making girls put on makeup before they go out for the contest so that if they get interviewed afterwards, they look good. <laughs> That's horrible. It's horrible. And horrible. It's a, it's a difficult thing to talk about as men because – I, what are we going to do? Like call out some ugly girls and say like, what about this ugly girl? She did really well. Like that's just so rude to say, but it's like, yeah, I, I really, it, you have to be careful asking those kind of questions because yeah. on, but it is the truth. And that's the thing. It's like the reality needs to be brought to the, the surface, which is like, to me, it's like, okay, well, Okay, when I look at a cute girl, I'm like, wow, she's hot or she's cute or whatever. But it's like, you better believe that Roxy had some kind of role or all these brands had some kind of role in subprogramming me to to think that way. Okay. You know, yeah, society I... got me to think that way. Not mm-hmm. that like I would be that way if I if I was brought up a different way, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, I mean, so. we, I, think, I think the conversation that I've been having this year is w- with intelligent men about um the 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 role of you know us in snowboarding supporting women who want to just be women in snowboarding right like when you go snowboarding right. with a group of people and a couple of them are girls and the girls are ripping the same as the guys we're riding the same terrain and you have that like feeling to say like wow you're really isn't it great you're keeping up like wow you must be real proud of yourself girl like you're riding with boys like that deep feeling inside of a good human being like yourself or myself is like i don't want that to be there and hopefully one day you're just like riding with girls i feel like I feel like we're not a hundred percent there, and if we got a long way to go, and yes, definitely. Well, you got to ride with the right girls. I'll tell you yeah. what; some girls yeah. are amazing, oh, and, and they have. shred. And I have shred, and I and I, and I, I don't, I don't even want to shout out girls that I've ridden with that just shred because, like, I would rather it wasn't a conversation we even had to have. And eventually, in the in the right. future, we probably won't. At some point, I don't know. We're in a pretty misogynist society. But I've, most of the guys that I've talked to off mic about it are of the mind that, hey, look, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not a dickhead. Like, I, I don't I, I'm sick of women being upset with guys like me because I'm not the problem. But unfortunately, we are all the problem because it's it's just so pervasive in our we don't even right. realize that that this shit is happening. Like I, I was really stoked to hear you say, you know, when, when you're giving an example of what you want more of on the podcast, you say women, because yeah, we're really yeah. guy centric without ever thinking about it. I, I like yeah. had to think about it in the first seasons. I'm like one out of 20 interviews is going to be a, a girl, at least one. And that's still not enough, but it's, uh, yeah, it, it, it is what it is, but you look at the numbers of what people download, people download a Jamie Lynn episode. Actually, you know what I'd like to say it out there. It's it's nice to have. My my top downloaded episode this year, including Terrier's, is Jess Kamira. So that's rad. That really? to me is cool. Yeah. Yeah. Because she really had something to say and people really fucking love her. And I hope if she listens to this, she knows that because People do love that girl because she's doing the right thing and she's going about yeah. it the right way. She's not angry about the position. She's just conscious. You know what I mean? She's conscious that yeah. if somebody would come up to her and say, hey, listen, you know what? If you just put on, why don't you ride for Roxy? Put on some makeup and we're going to make a fucking huge star out of you. She's like, I am a huge star. You know what I mean? And I right. did it on my own terms. And she almost, to her own detriment, like made it so hard for herself because she wanted to be able at the end of the day to just say, I did this on my own terms and none of those terms were, Oh, you're so pretty. You're a girl. Like, you know, right. And how sad is that? That people pave all these roads for people like her Mm -hmm. to to have an easier path. And Mm -hmm. she's like, no, I'm taking the hard way. Yeah. The uneasy way, because I will have more satisfaction at the end of the day. But how many people are willing to believe in themselves enough to be like, I'm going to just fight for what I believe in and not just try to take the easiest path. I don't think that there's anybody else other than Terry that I can think of that really 
stood up for, you know, for men's snowboarding because he had that thing with the Olympics. If you're if you're Todd Richards and you're announcing the Olympics, of course, you look at Terry and you go, you know what? It, it, he wasn't guaranteed to win. He wouldn't want he w- maybe wouldn't have won. And like if he doesn't go, he gets talked about like as though he would have won. Like when Sean White dropped out of slope style. And you know what? When I talk about Olympics and and competitions and stuff, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about because I don't really follow that stuff properly. But, you know, like a Todd Richards saying, you know, Terry may have had ulterior motives for not going to the Olympics. I don't think so. I think he really honestly hated the idea that Fist was going to do what Fist did. And he stuck to his guns over all these years. And I can't think of another example of somebody saying, you know, like Mark Frank rode for for Switch. He did. He was bummed. Yep. He didn't come out and say like, hey, you know what? The industry's bullshit and Steppen's fucking suck. He just like quietly put his tech nines back on and and recorded some of the most important and fucking epic parts of freestyle snowboarding. But he didn't speak out against you know, being misaligned with sponsors or whatever. Right. <laughs> I don't think anybody on the right. But, you know, that. Terry, Terry a was in a unique position at that point in time in that he was probably the only athlete in the world who could actually afford to do that. Sure. Right. Like right. every other, like Todd Richards, his sponsors were like, you're going to go to the Olympics. So that's amazing. Right. Right. Whereas Terry a was like, oh, actually, this isn't cool. And he was actually given the latitude credit to Burton to take that stance. Yeah. He right. Was. But yeah. but the reality is, had it been a different sponsor, had it been something else, had he had he had not just won like the last I don't know, like three or four seasons of uh, <laughs> yeah. ISF World Cups. Yeah. Um, it, had he not been in that exact position, uh, it, it wouldn't, his protest wouldn't have gone so well. And by the way, it's like, in a lot of respects, Terrier was right in hindsight. Oh, yeah. Right? And, yeah. And it's absolutely. like, there's, there is no, and there definitely is no putting that genie back in a bottle. No, now. it's, it's, but I, I don't think that he was saying that at that time. But in hindsight, he can say that, you know what I mean? Like, look, yeah. you know, and every every Olympics that goes by, he gets to go like, there you go. That's what you get, guys, yeah. you know? Well, it's funny. It's like every four years, Terry gets brought back up again. It's like, <laughs> what what was better than winning the first Olympics? Yeah. It's being brought up at every subsequent Olympics. Absolutely. At, ad nauseum like until the end yeah of i mean literally in like 2032 salt lake they'll be like and terry a. hawkinson boycotted the first <laughs> uh, he's now 72 years old yep. you know what do you think of the and, olympics uh, terry a. he gets that every year that's funny because i i called him and we did a phone interview and it didn't go that yeah. great and it didn't go that great yeah. mostly because his bullshit detector is really strong so when I'm leading with yep. a bunch of Olympic questions, he knows I don't really know anything about the Olympics, first of all. And second of all, it just kind of riles him up because the yeah. the one thing he's most famous for is hating the Olympics. So imagine like if I hate hamburgers and every time someone eats a hamburger, you're calling me on the phone <laughs> going, you still hate <laughs> hamburgers, dude? I'm like, yeah, I fucking hate them. I don't know why I keep getting these calls all the time. I fucking hate them. I don't right. want to talk about them. And I don't think that he dislikes the yeah. attention. But I don't I right. I, I, I he Yeah, he, it's like you break a, up with a you break up with some like Hollywood actress yeah. and then every time she like has another breakup the media calls you and you're like, Oh, leave me alone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> why don't you want to talk about, you know, like I I'm snow skating now or I'm you know, he's designing stuff with yeah. Burton still, and he's had this sure. really long, lucrative career with the best company in the business. Why don't you want to talk about that stuff? It's like, yeah, well, that's because they're really just looking for a sensational story, right? It's just, right. And, and, and nobody's really reported it the way that, you know, if you look at what Terry is talking about, it's real. Yeah. It is real. It, it is. There, there is corruption, but also that you know, there is a there is an argument against Terry's argument too. What would I've you been say, to five Olympics? I will admit. Yeah. What would you, you say know? the the strongest argument against it is? 
it gives snowboarders, a sport that is relatively a niche sport, the opportunity to show the world them at their best. Right. It's like a chance for Ben Ferguson, a nobody and by most American standards can show the world what he has to offer the world. OK. Right. And 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 no other in no other venue would he be allowed to do that. Sure, he could be in snowboard videos and impress other snowboarders, but really, it's like his grandparents are watching and his cousin in North Carolina is watching or whatever, yeah. right? And so that's the neatest thing I think about the Olympics is really it puts these athletes on on the world stage. The yeah. the thing that the sad part is that really it is it is designed for the benefit of the IOC. Of you know course. they're the ultimate winners at yeah. the end of the day. Yeah, and uh, and so so there's two sides of it though. There's two sides of it, and you better believe that Sean White would not be worth fifty some million dollars today if he wasn't a three time Olympic gold medalist. Of course, and not. you you better believe that like you know Gian Simon who won in 1998, he's set for life in Switzerland because the Olympics are a big deal in Switzerland. Is yes, that, is that true? Like, because that's that's he still has a car kind of sponsor in Switzerland. He still has a car sponsor. He rode for Seat. Are you serious? Seat. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I saw him at the Olympics this time. And like, yeah, he's still like a celebrity in Switzerland for being that first Olympic champion. Right. Right. And so, you know, uh, okay. I, I can't really argue against any of that stuff. because not So it, it's helped. Every every Olympics, it helps the winner of each one of those events. The winner, and it doesn't right. do anything for the other 50 competitors, basically. Or for the know? sport, right. And it's not... See, the, I think the thing that pisses Terry off the most, and I'm not speaking for him because I'm not... I'm not <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm just guessing. My guess is that um, he's he is a competitive snowboarder at heart, but he really wanted... Yep to compete against the best and so how do you get the best by having open events where anybody can go and not limiting sure. the people that can go by you know country and not giving people from some random country that has no snowboarding um the chance to go to an event that is you know the pinnacle of the world's watching you know what i mean like so like yeah you got most of the people that rule at snowboarding you know at least in 98 were from the u.s and you have right. to you have to pick five guys out of and then you get five guys from uganda that does and so like quickly people are are gaming this weird system but Competitive snowboarders have always gamed the system. Always, you know, whether it's Craig and Jimmy Scott. That's part of your job as a snowboarder is to game the system. It's not just competitive snowboarders; it's every snowboarder. If you're not gaming the system, you're not maybe even a snowboarder. <laughs> oh God! Right. Well, okay, but then there is the there are these guys. Everybody behind the scene, like the, the people that that people love. You know what I mean. Like the snowboarders yeah. that weren't pro snowboarders that just embodied what it meant to like get those good days. Probably the the people that enjoy the most powder are not the top pro snowboarders that we hear about, except maybe a Travis Rice, Austin Sweet, yeah. kind of like you know if you get into that group of, of sure. people. But are yeah. you enjoying Jeff Pensiero? It? Yeah, yeah, Jeff Pensiero yeah, Jeff, gets exactly. to ride the most powder. <laughs> yeah, probably. Right? Yeah. He's probably... I would guess. He's probably turned away more days, you know, oh, I got some work to do, more good days yeah. than I've, oh, yeah. I've ever had in my life. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it, it just depends on what you want to do. I, I really feel like snowboarding had that syndrome of wanting to be recognized as legitimate. And, and we went into it, you know, like so, like a lot of us, that was really important. It was important for me, you know, for my parents to be like, oh, snowboarding, it really is a thing. You could make a living doing it. Cool. You know, and once the, the right. Olympics came, the, you couldn't deny that. Right. You you think Sean White's not a successful person? He's $50 million? Like, holy crap. From snowboarding? Oh, I, I could argue that he's not. <laughs> <laughs> Terry, you could argue that he's not for sure. Yeah, because, but you know what? Yeah. I respect Sean White, though. I respect Terry. I respect anyone who's dedicated a significant part of their lives to snowboarding because we have that in common. Yeah. You know, we have that common ground. Yeah, I agree. It is a great group of people. 
that's the biggest part of it yeah. for me. It's oh, and that's why I'm still at it thirty years later is because I've there. Are, there's no other community of people that I feel as strongly about, I, and I don't. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know any other group. You know what I mean? That's got this much. Um, it's it would be easy to go out with any snowboarder on that day that I just had at Great Northern, and everybody's going to have a really good day. Yeah. You know what? Like snowboarding is actually a lot like the uh, the stand up paddleboard community. Psych. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing like stand up paddleboarding, <laughs> you know. But but there is like this brotherhood among riders, right, all over the world, and people really have this like common thing. And it's like to me, there's like a bond between snowboarders that doesn't exist necessarily in sport. Like that's not like a, that's something unique to snowboarding, maybe skateboarding and surfing as well, but it doesn't exist necessarily in every sport. Yeah, you know? yeah, it's not inherent. It's not inherent there for sure. And I yeah. mean, like hockey player, whatever. You take any passionate thing, and the guys at the top could probably all get along. I'd imagine, maybe not boxing. Sure. I don't know, maybe boxing or MMA. Yeah, those guys are probably all buddies, right? It's just, yeah, they, yeah, you know, I think I think there are some ones who are just because of a grudge or whatever, yeah. or like they got their ass kicked, they're a little salty still. But sure. I would say in general, they respect the endeavor, right? Just like, you know, like a half pipe rider respects a slope style rider and vice versa. If you're not in the same weight class, well, then you better have respect because right. they're right. they're doing the same ditch digging you are. Yeah, you know? it's true. Yeah, it's funny because there's always this divide in. Because I came to snowboarding from skateboarding, right? And in skateboarding, I always had a divide between, like, you're a vert rider or a ramp rider or a street rider or a big wheel guy or a small wheel guy or a long boarder. Oh, God forbid you're a long boarder. And snowboarding, we just did the same thing, right? You're a racer. You're a freestyler. Oh, you're a slope style yep. guy. You're a border cross guy. Like, we've always followed this kind of hazing that goes all the way back to, like, surfing like don't come surf this break if you're not good enough to surf this break but you know and skateboarding in the 80s was horrible for localism and you know people getting beat up or bullied or whatever at skate parks if they even existed here's the thing that we have though that skateboarding doesn't have What's and that? surfing doesn't have powder <laughs> we have this great yeah. uniting factor because it's like you can ask Olympic gold medalist Esther Ledecka what her favorite part of snowboarding is powder. Yeah. You can ask uh, Sage Kotzenberg what his favorite part of snowboarding is powder. Yeah. You can ask Sean White what his favorite part of snowboarding is and he'll be like, what's snowboarding? Just kidding. <laughs> um, no, but like literally like I would say that like pretty much powder is the great unifying factor um between every aspect of snowboarding where it's like no matter what you're competing in no matter what aspect um you know you're pursuing with a career or whatever powder is something you're gonna derive almost the most satisfaction from in the sport yeah you might not know it there's some times where you won't know it because i moved out here from we call it the east coast but ontario is really the middle of the country but i moved right. out here from other conditions you know like main made snow that was blue ice sometimes that was shitty and sure. you know after my first couple of days at baker i was convinced that powder sucked and there was a shirt on the rack that said powder sucks it was a roan rogers yep. shirt and i bought yeah. it and he was I my roommate it. at the time <laughs> I, I wore it un that was a joke by the way we loved riding powder of that was like to it keep was. it track free of course it was. And I wrote it unironically. So, like, I was like, fuck powder because I couldn't make it work for me because my board was cut down from a 160 down to, like, a 140. And I didn't right. have the right tool, and I didn't know anything about it. And I just thought, well, I I, I just want to hit a jump. Like, fuck powder, build a jump. But it yep. eventually, and not it didn't take that long, you know, you just have to – be yeah you're eventually everybody's gonna wind up in the powder i remember watching jimmy scott and he was struggling at mount bachelor in really good snow because he was such a competitive half pipe guy and he ruled at half pipe right. and even sean white right like of his own admittance in whatever movie that was where he went up to alaska he first was, descent yeah he wasn't he just wasn't ready 
he hadn't spent any time doing it yet. But yeah, right. of course, once you get that taste of it, once you see what it is, you're like, oh my god, only that, please. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's pretty funny. Like Jimmy Scott, like he's like got the half pipe contest, and it's like takes him a half hour to get to the top of the pipe. <laughs> 20 seconds to compete <laughs> yeah he would probably honestly like not ride down to the pipe with people he'd probably just like slink off and and get there some way where people couldn't see him because he he that's what he did with me when we were riding powder i was like go ahead he was like really? i don't want you to watch me do this yeah and, and <laughs> oh man and no offense to him he's an he is he oh. is a He's an incredibly. I feel rider. bad for people like me that, too. you know, yeah, people who too. don't actually t- get to experience that flying, floating sensation that powder offers you. Because it's like it's great to be competitive. And it's great if you're in a contest to beat the next person. But I tell you what, powder's a great equalizing factor yeah. where everyone's a winner. Yeah, you know, it's like 100%. at the end of a powder day, you're, you're not like, man, I got a better run than you. Not everyone's ever. a winner. Yeah, right. Whatever. It's like yeah. everyone wins. Yeah. And so uh, so I'm sorry that for people I feel bad for people who who don't really have that experience in snowboarding of like that. Like everyone's a winner feeling at yeah. the end of a powder day. Yeah. You you get in a cat or in a helicopter with any group of people. And yeah, <laughs> anytime that's a, you, you, you nailed it. That's the thing. If you can get into a situation where everybody has untracked runs right and they're not competing mm-hmm. with each other because you know in the local mountains here and i just talked uh with chris roach yesterday he went to mount rose is that where he's around and he yep. you know yep. everybody's stacking up for the for the patrol to get the thing open at noon you know and uh, like if you can eliminate that and just have hey yeah everybody's getting untracked <laughs> then you've got a group of incredibly happy people Welcome to Alaska. <laughs> I'll have to come up this year. Only man. powder. Yeah, I have to you come should up. come up. Yeah, I've, you I've should come up. It, it, it is. Uh, it's the game changer for a lot of people, mm-hmm. and to me, it, it is so rewarding. Like I would say that, like I've made magazines. I've been the editor of magazines. I've done all sorts of different things in snowboarding. I've affected television broadcasting, all sorts of things, right? But it's like. Yeah. I derive the most satisfaction in the sport of snowboarding by sharing Alaska, by right. showing people that pinnacle life experience. And literally people do have, you know, this experience that they don't even they're like, today was the best day of my life. And I'm like, well, you had a kid, didn't you? And they're like, well, yeah, that was good, too. Stop, stop being a dick, you yeah. know? Yeah. <laughs> That's so, amazing. So where does that drive come from for you? Because that's a part of your podcast is that you don't want to just talk straight snowboarding. You also want to give back to the general public. Do, do you think yeah. that goes back to the fact that your dad was an orphan and kind of pulled himself up from his bootstraps and did the Ivy League? Well, education thing no that and, that made me a workaholic so right. i would say that for the last 30 years i've worked between 80 and 100 hours a week oh my god right for 30 years Damn. right that's just the way i'm programmed that's the way my dad programmed himself and he gave it to me yeah you know and, and so the fact that i've been able to think mostly about snowboarding for 80 to 100 hours a week for 30 years is to my benefit yeah. right and, and had i been thinking about let's say oh i don't know ball bearings or something else that was a little less uh, interesting i might be like the most miserable person you could talk to instead i'm a pretty happy person right you know right. but but uh I, I don't i also feel like the last time i had a job the kind that you don't like where your boss yells at you mm-hmm. was in like 1994 you wow. know and everything has been more or less fun since oh that's and doing what i enjoy awesome. which is snowboarding yeah you know? And so, so that, that's been pretty cool. You're encouraging other people to find that passion or find that enjoyment. Out of yes. Life. So the idea is, is like the snowboard is actually the vehicle mm-hmm. that can show you the world that right. can introduce you to interesting and fascinating people like for you, Terry, yeah. or, you know, Jimmy Scott or whoever. Yeah. Right. It's like you've met, met all sorts of interesting, fascinating people. But yet you don't have to be a pro to have that same connection with the sport that I have, to meet interesting people, to go to new places, to challenge yourself. And so I see snowboarding and I see the mismarketing of snowboarding as this thing that is very one dimensional. And to me, snowboarding is about a rite of passage. 
right? Mm-hmm. It's about going on road trips. It's about not knowing where you're going to stay that night. It's about, you know, not knowing how you're going to afford tickets or, you know, calling in sick from school or whatever. All these things where you have these uncertain, unpredetermined outcomes and you have to kind of hold your feet to that fire and see how it's going to turn out. And I've done that time and time again through the sport of snowboarding, right. you know. And so to me, that's kind of the foundation of the podcast. And that's why it's like pros, graphic designers. It could be a photographer. It could be anybody who's basically dedicated a piece of themselves to the sport. How did you. Okay, so like speaking of all of this, did you like quit a job and say, fuck it, I'm doing a snowboard podcast and now this is going to be my job? Or are you doing this in your spare time between hammering nails and. Or some other, you know. I'm doing this more or less full time right now, I would say. Um, But, you know, I do have other jobs that I do um, that supplement my income. Yeah. Um, Because certainly this is not paying the bills. It is definitely a passion project. And for whatever reason, for better or worse, um, you know, a lot, uh, you know, if, if you read the art of the deal by Donald Trump, you would be led to believe that money is the way that you keep score. Right. Well, I would lead you to believe that life experience is also a way to keep score. Yeah, man. And yeah, that there's right. other ways to keep score. And so, you know what? I am not a, a wealthy person. Um, okay. But I do live in a mountain town and I do get to ride any day I want. And and you know what? And maybe I will eat a, a package of ramen still, you know, <laughs> yeah, sure, because sure. I'm not above that. You know, I'm not yeah. above anything. And, and so I'll sleep in my car. I'll, I'll uh, eat ramen. I don't care because right. really it's like it's those shared experiences that I have with people and, and that kind of that common bond of snowboarding and living in the mountains that I really share with people. Yeah, there's a different kind of wealth there, isn't it? It's weird when you yeah, see. Yeah, I, I got the I got the Bob Marley wealth. Yeah, it's weird <laughs> yeah. when you see the big wealth at say like a heli lodge, where the people are paying yeah. a few grand a day to be oh, riding yeah. what you're riding, and I'm making an assumption about you, but definitely for me, if I'm riding at a heli lodge, it's because I'm a guest of somebody. And I'm riding right. for for free or working washing dishes to to earn right. my spot in the copter, and uh, and then it's almost the most interesting and fun for me at at the end of the day where you're in the you're in the lodge and you're in the sauna with these people watching the way that they live their life and they're looking at you like you're some sort of strange animal too right like what, you yeah. mean you eat ramen like often or <laughs> yeah. like you don't only have... as often as I have to <laughs> yeah 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 so how are you not like out looking for a better job right now I'm like because why would I need a better job I'm at a heli lodge you know I don't right I don't need anything yeah other than this and my you know my wonderful family and my wife and my kids like I'm stoked I, I think I got that pretty early on that I wasn't going to be some sort of person that, that, I don't know, maybe I got it from a movie or something, you know, like sacrifices deep connections with my family for uh, a bunch of money. But I I struggled when I first had kids, you know, like I worked a lot of hours and and put in a lot of time away from the family and then if if my wife at the time would say, hey, you know, we could use it around the house more, I'd be like, I am working. That is my around the house. I'm working. That's everything you see at this house is here because I'm working. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but yeah. it's not the right way to be. I don't think it's not the right way for me. I don't think men necessarily need to be full breadwinner, you know work themselves to the bone guys money or money or bust like you were saying I, I don't measure it in a donald trump way that's for sure but yeah i mean i could use it'd be nice to have it'd be nice to have the kind of money where i could bring a bunch of my friends to a heli lodge that would be rad sure <laughs> sure but then you you yeah look at it from i, I try angle. to bring a bunch of my friends to alaska every year that's for sure yeah so do you look at it another I, angle? I don't pay for them to go. They have to pay their own way. But certainly I get try to get them to go up there and just ride with me up there. Yeah. And you provide the opportunity and go like, hey, here's the thing. And it's, 
you make it cheap. I got buddies that do that. I'm yeah. doing that this weekend, going to Revelstoke with a bunch of friends that are sweet. But, that you know. Oh, so, so. I hope you're ready for this weekend. You know, you guys are in. I was just looking at the weather, and it said you guys are going to have what's called a climate river or something like that. Oh God. Our, it's like literally like four back to back storms coming through. You're going to get like amazing pal at Revelstoke, I think. Oh, it, that's what he's telling me, and I'm just going. I, yeah, I'm usually the guy checking the checking the forecast for sure. It does feel nice to have somebody else taking care of that side of it and just like pumping me up for the trip. You know what I mean? Because yeah, right. You know those feeling that feeling like when you know it's going to be a really good day tomorrow and you're having a hard time sleeping. <laughs> I I've had that a few times this year. It's been it's I love that, but at the same time it's it's nice to have somebody else doing the work. Speaking of which, that's basically what I got you to do today for my podcast is like have, you know, the guy who's got a podcast that's very similar to mine. I I enjoy the episodes. I listened to the DCP one on the way back from uh from Revy this weekend and was like you nice. re- you really got some stuff that cuz I interviewed him as well he's really really well yep. spoken I listened to that one t- before I did my interview I listened to your interview Yeah that's what I, I do th- too th- Thanks the- by the way Eric for <laughs> for laying the groundwork for my interviews Yeah no problem <laughs> Yeah and I did the same thing with so I would listen to to Nate's interviews the not snowboarding podcast interviews of of people Chad Otterstrom's one where uh I was really psyched to talk to Chad and I was surprised yeah. by all the things that I knew about him for whatever reason. And then I realized I'd listened to his not snowboarding podcast, you know, within the last six months or something um, and had forgot right. that he had been on there, which is. Well, I, you know, what's right. you know, what's interesting about podcasts mm-hmm. is that they're actually far, far more in depth than anything you would find in magazines or online in that um, you know, like when I was working at magazines back in the day, like uh, in a major interview, let's say a major feature, like one per issue, there's like, you know, one major interview mm-hmm. and it's, you know, um, you know, 12 or 15 pages or whatever. And, uh, you know, that interview will be about 3000 words on paper. Yeah. Right. I did a transcription of one of the podcasts I did. It was yeah. 15,000 words, <laughs> yeah, right? Five go. times the amount of content yeah. that you would get from, from like a regular interview. So I, I do believe that there actually is more opportunity to go deeper with, with podcasts than there, than there is with other mediums. I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, people, uh, Rob Dow from Wired is all, all, not always has has mentioned like, do you want to do a video version? It would it would make a lot of sense. And I'm like, I think it might hinder the guests from being as open, right? Like when you see yourself in a video, right? I don't, may, I don't know why I'm saying that. we'll see. It's the same. I'll let you know. We're starting this week with video. <laughs> Way to go, man! That's awesome. So you've set up, um, you set up cameras and and. Uh, how are you doing that if your guy is somewhere else? Or are you doing that for um, in-person interviews only? We do it different ways. We're working on that still, the technology. We're trying to get it dialed still, so it might oh. be a little bit rough at first. So sure. I'm, I don't have it 100% dialed yet, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, but yeah. we are definitely working on it. That's one of those things where I think it's like I am a big believer in this idea called Kaizen, constant improvement. You look at what you did in the past, you try to tinker on it and improve on it slightly on on the aspects that you can identify that are easy to improve, and then you take another look at it after you've improved it and then re-improve it again, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, we're launching, right? So it's like I don't really have good advice for you on how to do that yet. (laughs) I will. I will. Once I have it figured out, once I feel confident about about pulling it off properly, yeah. but certainly um, that's something that I've wanted to do for a while, and so that's been a goal of mine. But like, really, the way our show is set up right now, it's actually three shows per week, like three separate shows. Yep. So on Mondays we have our news show. On Wednesdays we have like an industry insider, someone who like has that kind of like sage wisdom, and then on Fridays we have like an athlete, someone who like Rad. you know pro- proved it with their knees. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. for Fridays. Just for the athletes, we're going to introduce the video. 
Cool. Right. So like our Mondays will be audio only. Wednesdays will be audio only. And yeah. then Fridays will be video. That's how we're starting it anyway. So yeah, um, we'll see. Awesome. We'll see how it goes. We'll see if people like it. And we got a couple already recorded. So now we're getting we're actually holding our own feet to the fire as far as like, <laughs> oh, wait, we're now having to add a bunch more people because we don't actually have episodes recorded of pro athletes with video. That's a smart thing to do, man. The challenge is. The challenge is the fun part, right? Like it makes it fun yeah. when when the episode comes out. You're like, "Holy jeez, that was so much work." Woo! That was fun. And then you realize, "Ah, oh, yeah. fuck, we need another one by next Friday. This is insane." Yeah. I can't believe we we're <laughs> doing this. But yeah, and then you get it under under uh, control. The, the good thing fun. is I've been I've been holding my feet to the fire with deadlines for like 30 years as well. Yeah. So I'm yeah. I'm no stranger to deadlines and I understand the importance of making it and also like and also just meeting those deadlines as far as like, you know, I I, I will realize like okay, that even though it could take 10 hours to get this done, I have 4 hours, so what can I do with 4 hours? Yep. You know. Yeah. Oh, that's so. cool. Yeah, I I quit and I've talked about it on the show a couple of times. I quit after every episode for I think all of season 1 two and three most of them until sean kearns's episode where i realized what it was that i actually wanted to do which is like this mm -hmm. like just a long form conversation that i'm not going to edit there's no weird pauses or shit that we have to really edit out like it used to be literally 30 hours a week of editing or 40 and then the edited product was not necessarily better than just leaving everything in you know yeah. So, um, yep. I, I would have to listen to this Ira Glass quote that he said a few years ago about people who do creative work. And he said, listen, the, the reason you get into it is because your taste is killer. And you know, for the first while, while you're making stuff that the things you're making is not really actually that great because your taste is mm -hmm. good. But so like the main thing to do is set a deadline and make an episode a week, make, do the job that you want to have. You know what I mean? And, uh, yep. And I would have to listen to that because I'd be like, ah, oh, fuck that episode was embarrassing. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to do this anymore. It's so much work. And then I would, you know, talk to Chuck Barfoot or someone and I'd be like, that was so much fun. I love that. If I could only get it to the point where, it's not so much work. It's mostly just this fun thing. So I, I thought maybe I'll get someone else to edit. And then Kearns was like, no, just don't edit. And then I was like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So we'll see yeah. what happens. I'm going to continue to learn and grow as a person. Same as what you're saying, you know, look at what I did before and improve on it. That's, that's really incredible advice. It's, it's the right thing to do. Plus get started. Right. That's the thing. A lot of people mm -hmm. procrastinate. A, a lot of the guys I talked to have said, I wanted to do a podcast. I said, yeah, you should have. Or you should. Still. Yeah, you should have. I, yeah. I wasn't doing one. I didn't even think of it three years ago. You know, it's yeah. like, yeah, it just you just got to do it. You know, and the thing is, it's like, am I going to be a podcaster forever? Well, I don't know. Maybe, right. maybe not. But either way, I'm definitely learning by doing it. Yeah, you, you enjoy know, and it. I'm expanding my, my knowledge by doing it. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, it's it's fun. That's the thing. It's fun talking. Obviously, yeah. you're a guy like me who who could talk to somebody you don't really know that well or have you've never even met before and have a, a coherent conversation and enjoy yourself, right? I hear that in your right. episodes, so that's good, man. I'm I'm glad to yeah. be in good company, and I I've always maintained that if you know Nate at, at not snowboarding, you know any of the other snowboard podcasts out there, I I I'm rooting for all of them. Like I would listen to twenty yeah. a week. You know what I mean? Like I'm that guy that I'm a mailman, so I'm walking around and I've got time to listen Man. to all your episodes and everything that everybody's making to this point, and it's only after. Um, I wish there were more people like you because I could put out a lot more content. <laughs> yeah, I really have just a body of work right now. It's like it, it actually is is pretty 
Um, it's been such an incredible learning experience for me because it's like, I, you know, I went into this being like, oh, I was, I was the editor in chief of snowboarder magazine for seven years. And I, yeah. I started tailgate Alaska and I started zines and all this stuff started snowboard mag. Yeah. And, uh, I, I know what there is to know about snowboarding. Turns out I don't, you know, <laughs> turns out that actually every person based on having a different perspective on the sport and just having a different filter they're looking through at snowboarding. Um, as a totally different perspective than I do. And so every single person, every guest I've had, I've learned something from. That's rad. That's a good spot to end yeah. it, I think, dude. Thanks for talking to me. It, it was a lot of cool. fun. And uh, we got to keep in touch. And I'll probably see you at Tailgate at some point. Going to make an effort to get up Definitely. there. Definitely. I'd like to go to Alaska. I, I've always wanted to go. I mean, not when I thought Pounder sucked, but yeah, since then. <laughs> And right on. Right yeah. on. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you for having me as a guest on the uh, fucking rad podcast. It is fucking rad. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. That's epic, dude. Effing rad shout outs this week to Al Clark and to Great Northern Snowcats. Go to greatnorthernsnowcats.com and check out that operation. They've got great steep terrain, amazing snow, and incredible guides and staff and cat drivers. Everybody there was amazing. And thanks again to Al for that. WiredSnowboards.com. Go there. Check out their boards. Order yourself a custom board. I'm so proud to say that every board I ride this year is a handmade board made in a factory 10 minutes from my house by people who give a shit about snowboarding, which is epic. I love Grouse Mountain. Thanks to Grouse for supporting the show. To Kine Outerwear and Accessories. All right, I got to give away one of these backpacks. I think I still have four. So the first person to shout out three people that should follow the F and Rad Snowboard podcast on our next post of the Mark Sullivan episode and who follow Dukine, do that, and follow Wired Snowboards. Um, I'll put the first 10 of you in a draw and then I'll do a draw uh, midweek. And I'll announce a winner, you know, next Wednesday at the beginning of the show. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. So do all that stuff. I, I forget what I just said. And be sure to come back next week for another episode of the F and Rad Snowboarding Podcast brought to you by SIA Productions. <laughs>